I can't have him running around like that. Uh, Brother Mike, you pray for the service? I can do that. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Amen. Uh, Second Timothy chapter four. Talking about the world, the flesh, and the devil. Right now we're still on the world. Second Timothy chapter four, verse seven says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Three times, Trinity, he says, I have. So he had some security up there that he knew that he did everything that he had to do and he finished strong. And so we were talking about how last Sunday that the, the myth when you get saved is that it gets, life gets easier when it's the exact opposite. It's, uh, Paul says it's a fight. So he's telling you right here, look, I've done it. Last week we saw that he said uh, the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses. He says we used to walk according to the course of this world. We used to be under subjection of the prince of the power of the air, but not anymore. Uh, verse 6, he has that security. He says, for I am now ready to be offered. So apparently you can reach your... Uh, a point in your Christian life where you can be ready to be offered. That you're, you can acknowledge that the time of your departure is at hand and you'll be uh, willing to go, you know. Oftentimes we, we get to the end of something and we look back on it with regrets. So you have Jacob, when Pharaoh asked him, he said, oh, you know, what, 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 how would you describe your life? And his, his term, his phrase was, Few and evil have been the days of my pilgrimage. And I would say you the last thing you would want after somebody took a beating for you and died for you is to look him in the face and say, you know, few and evil are the days of my pilgrimage. I didn't do enough. I could have done more. I, I failed, right? So that's, the other opposite would be this guy right here. He says, look, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. The time of my departure is at hand. He's ready to board. He's ready to come up. He says, I know this because in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, and I have kept the, the faith. He goes as far as to say in verse 8, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So apparently you can get crowns, and you can know them, what, what those crowns are. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, and you better thank God that uh, God is righteous. The judges down here may be corrupt. People down here may be corrupt. But the one that you serve, he always bats a thousand. The righteous judge shall give me at that day. Right? I always find that interesting. You know, we talked about, uh, you know, the Lord's personal, right? So the cross, he did it personal. When he told you in John 14 about your mansion, prepare a place for you, he said, I'm going to prepare it for you. Because it's a personal relationship that you need. So he says right here, look, um, the righteous judge, the guy that we know that's doing right, the guy that created the world, the one who died for the sins of mankind, that guy, uh, the man Christ Jesus, every tongue and every knee shall bow and confess. 
He says, that guy shall give me at that day. And then here's the blessing right here. See? And not only me, right? Because we elevate people in the Bible and we say, well, I can never reach those heights. Well, according to him, yes, you can, because he says, and not to me only, but unto all them. And we know that in the original Greek and Hebrew, all means all. All them also that love his appearing. So it's very, the, the, the uh, requirements, it's one thing, all you got to do is love Jesus Christ. And so the world has conditioned you and me and everybody, if you're saved, to not love Jesus Christ, to not want to look forward to see him because you have all these things down here. So you're constantly told, you know, set your affection on things above. The devil tells you, no, it's down here. Look around. And if you're lost, well, you're not thinking about uh, heavenly things. You're not worried about what, uh, what's coming next because you die and they bury you in the ground. You become a tree and they cut the tree down and they print a Bible on it. If you look at verse 3, he tells you, look. The time's going to come, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And you're here. You are here. So when you're at the mall, they have the little map that says, you are here. You are here. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And that's your body of Christ in your church today. It's the itching ears. It's I go to the place that makes me feel good, and I hear the things that I want to hear. And I enjoy the things that make me feel good. And the pastors are not going to preach anything that's contrary because they have the biggest, the biggest issue is you, if you're looking at church as a pastor, as a business, then there's a lot of compromises you have to make. And so you got to find out what will scratch the itching ears. You got to take out doctrine. The, big, the biggest problem in the church today is Jesus Christ. So he says, in verse 4, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. And so you hear the truth is falling in the streets. You hear uh, there's a famine in the land, right? And it's not a food, it's, it's the words of God. Nobody puts an emphasis on anymore on it. It's come as you are and stay as you were. And if it feels good, do it. And if it doesn't feel good, then don't worry about it. And if you're supposed to live like Jesus Christ lived, do you think that he lived the life that he enjoyed everything that he did? think he enjoyed taking that beating? you think it felt good at that point? It didn't, but he still did it. Because like Paul here, the mentality is, well, I have an end game, an end goal, and I'm going to get to the end regardless of circumstances or opposition. And that's why he tells you you're going to have to be a soldier. That's how he can say, I fought a good fight, because he knows, look, First of all, if I can do it, you can do it. That's what he's trying to tell you. And he's trying to tell you, look, it's, it ain't going to be easy. There's effort required. And they say the, the best things in life are worth fighting for. And we like to uh, use that for anything but the Christian life, unfortunately. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 24 says, know ye not? So I like how he, when he's talking to people, he's, he's asking, like, how, you don't know this? Like, this is like remedial stuff. This is basics right here. Know ye not that they which run in a race, you know, run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. And so he's going to use real world examples that you can see and you can relate to. So he says, if these guys down here are doing all this effort and they're putting all this uh time and energy into something down here with the expectation to, to win. So that's your Christian life. You are in a race. It was, was it, um, instead of looking at any, everybody else's race, you need to look at your own race. You need to worry about what it is that the Lord has for you. Figure that out and accomplish that. Paul is not here talking about other people. He's not worried about, well, I got a crown, but my crown's not like this guy's crown. Or I, I endured all this to get this, but this guy got it easier. Paul is very uh, focused on giving you information based on his life. 
based on what he's seen with himself. And he'll point out people that have fallen. So he'll say, demons have forsaken me. And he'll tell you why, because he loved this present world. But the only reason why he can tell you, hey, this guy fell because he loved the world is because he was in the same circumstances. So he tells you, look, there's a fork in the road. I decided I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. Demons decided on other things. But you make the choice. So he says, if everybody's in the race, right, they all want to receive the prize. You know there's first place, second place, third place. The, so in your life, you have the, the perfect, the acceptable um, will of God. Okay, so he tells you, look, so run that you may obtain. So the expectation is, look, I want to win. I want to be number one. I want to be, you know, the guy that Jesus Christ or the woman that Jesus Christ saved me to be. 25 says, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That, but we an incorruptible crown. So once again, it's it's pointing you upward, saying, look, they're doing all this down here for something that at the end of the day is going to get burned up. They put all their effort in the what it, bodily exercise, profit a little. So you have 24-hour gyms that are packed from the same hours as you have church by Christians. It's because the emphasis is everything down here. They put all this work on things that goes back to the dirt. And he's telling you, no, look, it profits little. Like, there, there's a good thing. Keep your body in subjection. You are the temple of God. But that should not be your main focus. Your main focus should be um, the things above. So you have people that, that Christianity is not their life, but it's a part of their life. And you got it backwards. So he says, look, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, we're in this fight together. We're trying to be number one for Jesus Christ. We're trying to get an incorruptible crown. So he says, look, um, and once again, he's giving himself as an example because he went through it. So he says, I therefore so run, um, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. So he's telling you, look, I'm not wasting time. It's not wasted motion. I'm not punching the air, all right? If I'm going to hit something, I'm going to hit it on target. So he says, I run, right? Not as uncertainty. In other words, he already established long ago, look, this is what I need to do. This is what I've been called to do. And this is what I'm going to accomplish. And so now, now that he, he knows what the focal point is and what, the, what it is that the Lord would have him to do, which every one of us should give account of himself to God, right? Judgment first, must first begin at the house of God. So in other words, you have to figure it out. I can't tell you what you got to do. That would be a waste of time if I told you you got to do X, Y, and Z, and you did X, Y, and Z, and the Lord says, well, I didn't call you to do that. It's just a waste of time. So he says, look, I figured out what I got to do. There is no uncertainty anymore. I know what the end game is. I know what I call to do. So now I run. In other words, everything that needs to be done to accomplish that goal, I'm going to accomplish it. So if I'm going to be a preacher, I need to be in the Bible so I can know what to preach. If I'm going to help somebody overcome a loss or a tragedy, well, I have to have overcome a loss and a tragedy similar to be able to relate to them. I mean, if you haven't, you, you can do the best you can. But it's different when somebody has gone through what, you know, what you're going through. They can give you an, a perspective that not everybody can. So he figured it out a long time ago, what he needs to do, and he's doing it. At 27, so we're talking about the world and the flesh and the devil, we're still on the world, but 27 tells you, look, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection because the body wants to do what the body wants to do. And the body, unfortunately, wants nothing to do with this. So he tells you, look, I've got to put myself under subjection. i got to lock it down. I can't give him, you know, they say give it a, an inch and it takes a mile. He says, i got to be very, very careful with what I do with this body. So I have to keep it under subjection. So what does that mean? That means if I know then I'm going to put Jesus Christ first and I'm going to put this Bible as the center of my life and I'm going to take this Christianity seriously and not, like, and not be like all the other hypocrites out there, right? not be a, uh, an example of what not to do, but be an example of what to do, then i got to keep this body under subjection. i got to surround it with things of God. So that's the only way you're going to be able to survive it. So if your issue is music, you got to find the right kind of music. 
if your issue is movies, then you got to find the right kind of uh, media to consume. If your problem is reading, right, you got a lot of fantasy and other stuff out there that if you're not careful can lead you in the wrong direction, well, then like I say get back, get read the things of God. I know pastor always jokes about we read books about the Bible, but not the Bible. I would say do both. So some spirit out there motivated these guys to write these books. So if, if God told these guys to write these books, I would tell you, well, then consume them, read them. So they're going to help you out. And he says, so why do I keep my body under subjection? Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So in other words, they'll be able to point at him and say, oh, you're one of those guys that, um, what's that phrase, uh, do what I say, not as I do? And there's a lot of people like that. There's the whole, uh, the law for thee, but not for me. And there's a lot of that. So he says, look, if I'm not careful, if I don't put my body under subjection, if I don't have that flesh put in its place, then it's very easy for me to be a hypocrite. It's very easy for me to fall and uh, do the things that I shouldn't be doing. Find, uh, find James. Chapter 1. Verse 22 says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So if you wanted to ask yourself, can, can I be deceived? Well, according to James, yes, you can. So it's be ye a doer of the word and not a hearer only. So once again, like Paul says, I'm not beating the air. There's, there's effort required here. The theme and the expectation of a Christian in, you know, in trying to walk behind Jesus Christ is that it's a fight. Um, deceiving your own selves. 23, 4, if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, so they're your hypocrites, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of, of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So there are blessings required, uh, received, rather, when you do what the Lord have you to do. So he, know, he, he knows it's a fight, right? He was tempted in all manners, yet without sin. So he knows what you're going through. We're not in the book of Job where you can say, well, you don't know. That ended when he was walking on the earth. That ended when he lived perfectly and he died for you. So he says, look, in 23, and 23 is... What I would say is the biggest issue with your uh, modern pastors today. It says, For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. And the 24, for he beholdeth himself. All right, so now he's going to elevate himself and goeth his way. So now he's high minded, he's above everybody else. And why is that? Because and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he, he was. So if you think the Bible says that you shouldn't be, uh, you should be humble, meek, right? You shouldn't be uh, elevating yourself, because then somebody's going to look at you and they're going to they're going to tell you what you really are, and then you're going to feel bad. You're supposed to be humble and let the Lord elevate you. But down, we got it twisted. Um, your Bible teaches that there should be growth. There's an expectation. So he pauses, he says, little children, he says, young men, and then he says, uh, old people. No, he say old people. But he, there's, a, there's a growth, right? So he's telling you, look, 
the same way as a kid has to grow before, you know, they don't move, they crawl, they walk, and they run. So your Christian life is you don't move, you're just learning, you get in the milk, trying to figure things out. You got saved, now what happens? The crawling is you finally hold a Bible, you learn that it opens, move the pages around, right? Then the walking is, well, okay, now I'm coming to church, I'm more comfortable holding the Bible, I've got a, a teacher, a preacher, a pastor, I'm learning. And then the running is, okay, well, he said he runs to win the race and the prize. So now it's, okay, now that I've, I've established everything and I've built up the foundation on top of Jesus Christ, now I can run the race. Now I can run and do what he called me to do. But if you're not careful, 25 says liberty. So Paul says, use your liberty, but not for an occasion of the flesh. The world tells you you have free will. You know, do do what you want to do. Enjoy, indulge yourself. And I'm telling you, you can straddle the fence as long as you, as you want, I guess, for as long as you can. But eventually, you're going to have to make a choice. I know from my Bible that if you are not prepared for battle, you don't stand a chance. There are constant kings, there are constant individuals in your Bible that adversity and opposition came. And when they were prepared, and when I mean prepared, I mean they leaned not onto their own understanding. They came out on the other side better than they, than they started. And then I know that there are kings and people that when they weren't prepared for battle or they weren't where they were supposed to be, they were ineffective. And you have the perfect example of that is David. He was the, the soldier. He had all the training, all the ability, all the wisdom, all the knowledge, right? Then he let him, he kept his blade sharp. He would go out to battle like the kings were supposed to do. But the moment he put his sword down was the moment that the devil presented something to him. And it's interesting, if you study sin, like most of the time, it, it always starts with the eyes, right? So David saw Bathsheba. Eve saw the fruit. The devil showed Jesus Christ all the kings of the world. And it's because of the eyes. So you're, you're told in your Bible, I'll set no wicked thing before my eyes. I think it's Lamentations that says, my eye affected my heart. So in other words, there, there's a connection to your body. And the world knows that. So if you want, a, if you want something that's perverted and unnatural to be accepted, well, you start when they're like that. So when they see it like that, it's normalized by the time they get to this age. And that's why you have the way that things are. So if you have a little kid and you tell them, don't worry about God, or we don't really know what he says, by the time he grows up, if he is a Christian, yeah, they're, they're superficial. And that's what you have in America today. The world has Christians. America is full of Christians, but they're superficial. They have no backbone. The first strong wind knocks them over and they're out. Tragedy comes, and the expectation is, if you're in your Bible, it's, well, look up. There's a problem right now, and it's, you know, Lord, I need help. And uh, what the world tells you is, well, if, if God was really up there, he wouldn't let it happen. So then instead of, of Lord, help me, it's, well, how could you? And uh, that's, that's the devil laughing at you. Remember, we'll get to him at the end, but. If he's the accuser of the brethren, and he told God, I'm going to get Job to curse you to your face, I would say if he went after Job, who's in this book, he'll come after you that was not in this book. If he had the, the audacity to go after Jesus Christ, I would tell you, uh, you, me, who's nothing, yeah, he'll come after us too. But thankfully, if you have your Bible, you have expectations. Had David woke up that day, right? Because you wake up sometimes. We'll use Sunday as an example. How many Christians woke up today and they're like, I'm not feeling it. And they didn't come to church or Sunday school or whatever. And then what happens, happens. The problems, the storms, whatever. And whatever. you're more likely to, to, to fall into sin. Had David woke up and said, you know, I'm not feeling it, but I'm going to do it anyways. Because that's what character is. It's doing something that you don't want to do because you know you have to do it. You would have had several chapters spared. His kingdom would have been spared. His son 
Christ's lives would have been spared. Unfortunately, that was not the case. And so part of your training, if you're going to be a soldier, if you're going to be prepped for battle, part of your prepping is to know your enemy. So the Bible makes it very clear, your three main adversaries, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So he tells you back in Corinthians, you know, I'm not beating the air. I'm, I know what my fight is. And then he tells you later on, oh, I, I, I accomplished it, right? In Timothy. So you know that these guys, they call themselves prize fighters. Before you see them on TV or on pay-per-view or whatever fighting, they had six, four, four, six months training camps that they called. And they're, you know, a good coach shows the guys, look, this is who you're fighting, and this is what he's good at, and this is what he's bad at, and they build a game plan on how to win the fight. So you have your game plan here. All your tools and all the training that you need to know your enemies, to find the victory, is in this Bible. And if you know anything about prize fighters, when you know the guy that's been in the gym training on, and when, when you see him on fight night, and you know the guy that wasted his time. He wasn't taking it seriously because he usually gets knocked out in the first round. So my question to you would be, if the Bible says a just man falls seven times and gets up again, that means there's going to be days where you get knocked down. It's whether you can get up or not. So the world's going to give you everything that you need to not take this seriously so that you don't, so that if you do get knocked down, you don't want to get up or you can't get up. But the, God's giving you your, your, your playbook. He's giving you everything that you need to have a victorious Christian life. Because if he didn't, how would Paul know? I, I have a crown waiting for me. How could he know? I fought my fight. I did it. I always look at things like that, and the question I ask myself is, if these guys can know, you know how do they know, and how can I know? And so you want the strategies on how to, how to counter the world, how to counter the devil, how to counter the flesh. you got to spend some time with Jesus Christ. You got to spend some time in the Bible so the Lord can open your eyes and give you wisdom, and give you understanding. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. So the world is filled with places, it's filled with people, it's filled with. Uh, Tons of things to get your eyes off of Jesus Christ, off the Lord, off of eternity. And so the world tells you you have all the time in the world to accomplish the things that you want to do. And so if the world is opposite of the Bible, what does the Bible say about your life? It calls it a vapor. So it says in the grand scheme of things, you're, this part of your life down here, it's a vapor. So it appears for a short while and then it disappears, it's gone. And so he tells you, redeem the time, which is which means, you know, Brother Hines said, get it back. Because the days are evil. The whole world lies in wickedness. The only way you're going to redeem anything is if you got a, a closer walk with Jesus. The hymns that says he, and he walks with me and he talks with me, the only way he's walking with you and talking with you is if you're in the places he's going to be. Or you're talking about the things he wants to talk about. Um, what fellowship hath um, God with Belial? You can't. You can't have the can't have a seat at the table of God and the table of the devil. Colossians chapter three, verse one says, "If ye then be risen with Christ." So we're talking about Christians. It tells you, look, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. So he tells you in verse 1, look, a desire for something is you have to go after it. So he tells you, seek it. You have to look for it. You gotta, so the Bible tells you, uh, they search the scriptures daily. It tells you to study to show thyself approved unto God. It tells you it's the glory of kings to conceal the matter. Okay, but you have to do the effort to find it. You have to do the digging. You have to do the searching. And that requires effort, right? You, and you have to have the desire. But it also requires discipline. 
you have to sit with with if the whole if the Lord is patience, right? We talked about this. He's patient. Everything is wait. Tree. By the time you plant the tree, well, the seed becomes a tree, and then you get the fruit. That's time. That's a lot of time. So everything with the Lord is patience. You want or need something, and you know you need it now. And the Lord says, I know you need it now, but it ain't now. You're going to have to endure. You're going to have to have some trials here. And then you get it, if you stay faithful, you get it at the, at the back end. So the world is the opposite, though. Everything is now. So you can order anything on your phone. You can find anything on TV, on the phone. Everything is instant. You had AOL dial up. You had to wait like five minutes for that thing to connect to the internet. Now you just hit Google Chrome and you're there. You've come a long way when it comes to technology. And unfortunately, you've used it for the wrong things. So instead of opening uh, your phone up to look at a Bible app or to, to, you had a question about something in the scriptures and you could use Google, there's nothing wrong with Google. Just be careful what sources and what uh, websites you use, I would say. Instead of doing that, you're looking at wicked. You're looking at things that are fleshly and, and that does you no benefit. So you have to have discipline. You gotta, you gotta tell yourself, look, these are the things that I'm gonna do for the Lord. That don't mean you gotta do them all, you know, in that hour. I would say spread it out. Now there are blessings if you seek them early. There are blessings if you give them the first fruits of your day. But you'd have to ask yourself, well, what, what would be better? You woke up and you gave two hours to the Lord right there. And then the, the rest of the 10 hours was for, the, were for the, the world and the flesh and the devil. Or spend time with them. You read here, you pray there, and you, you constant communication with the Lord throughout the day. And that's going to help you clean, cleanse your mind. That's going to give you the strength that you need. And that's gonna want. That's gonna give you the want and the desire to seek those things which are above. And so he tells you, look, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Uh, you know why he's got to put that? Because if you said above and just left it like that, you'd have somebody come up with some new theology on, well, we worship the clouds and the and the sky or, or the stars. But he tells you, look, it's in the third heaven, right? What you want to uh, receive, the things that you can have. It's in the third heaven, where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God. So he tells you, look, in verse 2, set your affection on things above. So what are affections? So things that you love, the things that you have desire towards. He says, well, put them up there. Because like I said, down here, your time is short. Up there, there's eternity. That's never ending. So he says, look, put it up there. Because in the long run, when it's all said and done, it'll be worth it all. He says, not on the things on the earth. And so the world tells you everything's down here. They might encourage you to get saved. They might encourage you to be a Christian. As long as it doesn't affect them, they're fine with it. And when they see you trying to get closer to Jesus Christ or to take things seriously, they call you the fanatic. And they tell you, well, don't worry about it. It's not that serious. Or you want to go to church on a Sunday, and they tell you, well, there's 52 Sundays in a, in a year. What's wrong with missing one? Well, because one concerns into two, and then two into four, and then you do the math. It's always, the opposition always comes when it comes to doing things with Jesus Christ. When it comes to the Bible, when it comes to uh, church, when it comes to reinforcing that foundation, building upon that foundation. Well, every time you try to get gold and silver and precious stones, the world wants to throw on top of you wood, hay, and stubble. They want you to stay focused down here because if you can stay focused down here, then they know, whether they know it or not, they know you're not getting anything up there. So the, he says, look, set your, things, your affections on things above. The devil knows if I could put everything around you down here and you're looking around, you're not looking up. If you're not looking up, you're not worried about Jesus Christ. You're not worrying about how you're going to face them. You're worried about down here. And if you're not doing nothing down here, you are an ineffective Christian. And ineffective Christians, that's a victory for the devil. But if, he's, if it's told that he's wiser than Daniel, if it says he's perfect in beauty, if he could quote scripture at Jesus Christ, 
if he knows how this Bible ends, what, what, what's, the, what's the point? And it's because he wants to take as many as he can with him. You're told, right, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it's the beginning of knowledge, it gives you understanding, prolong, and even prolongs your days. And you want to yoke up with the world with, that the world does not fear your God. In fact, if you get to Psalms 2, it tells you that the whole world is in counsel against God. They're trying to figure out how to get rid of him. I mean, they've done a pretty good job. They've kicked him out of your schools. They've kicked him out of your uh, government. Uh, they've kicked Jesus Christ out of churches. They don't say Jesus Christ. They don't say the Lord Jesus Christ. They say Jesus. That can, Paul says there are, there are many Jesus on other Jesus. Or they just keep it vague and they say God. Because that could be anybody. You know, technology could be a God. It could be Allah. It could be uh, the Mormon Jesus. The Mormon Jesus and the, and the biblical Jesus, they're not the same Jesus. But why are you supporting somebody or a group of individuals that take counsel against the one that died for you and they think that they're going to be able to stop them? And I can tell you right now that I, know, I can read and that's not how that turns out. So the phrase, fear of the Lord, right, if, uh, if the AI is correct, it appears 30 times in your Bible. So 30 times. So if God had to tell you something one time, we, we say that all around here, you know, that's important. But if he's got to say it 30 times, then uh, some of us are hard-headed enough that he said put it 30 times. It was important. Emphasize it. Uh, head of Second Chronicles 19. Verse 7, wherefore, now, now, right, not, not later, not tomorrow, now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor uh, taking of gifts. Now, before we get to the fear of the Lord, look, no taking of gifts. In other words, you ain't going to bribe God. This whole negotiating thing that you do every day. Well, Lord, I'm going to do this, and if I do this, you know, you'll do this. It says he's not a respecter of persons, okay? And you're, the perfect example of that, I would say, is Moses. All right, he had to endure these, these uh, ungrateful bastards taking them out of, out of Egypt. And all they kept doing was murmuring. God, and he's, he's telling God, kill him, and, he, and the God's saying, oh, I can't. And he, God says, I'm going to kill him. He says, no, you can't. That guy went through all that, part of the Red Sea, went through all the, uh, all the plagues with Pharaoh, gave these guys the, the law, had to deal with uh, poor Aaron who had a calf jump out of nowhere out of the fire. That guy, I would say after going through all that, that guy, you, you, I respect him. I wouldn't have been able to put up with them for as long as he did. And God said, you ain't going to the promised land. So if he didn't, if he said that guy, Moses, the friend of God, I don't respect you. Uh, you didn't do what I told you to do. What makes you think that you're going to be able to, re to negotiate with God? It don't work that way. Um, because of the sin that was on Jesus Christ, he had to turn his back on him. I would say you would respect Jesus Christ. That's your son. He's coming to die for the sins of the world, but because he had sin on him, he couldn't. And so, looking at you, who are not Jesus Christ, no respect to persons, nor taking of gifts. We talked about that. You need bribing him. And he tells you, look, there is no iniquity with the Lord our God. So he's not like us. He's perfect. He's without sin. You, you, you are not going to take him 
to all the places that you shouldn't be going. You're not going to force him to be a partaker of your wickedness. And he says at uh, the beginning of verse 7, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. So he's telling you right here, look, you should fear that guy. Right? The, the man upstairs. They tell you, be careful when the man comes around. Yeah, you should because he made heaven and earth. He makes your heart beat. He brought you into this world. He can take you out of this world. Yeah, you better fear him. You better walk circumspectly. You better be careful what you do and say. Because at any moment, he can wipe you out. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. How little effort did that take for him to wipe out those cities? And it even it, it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, but later on it says, and the neighboring cities. So there was collateral damage there. That was effortless. How did he make the, the, the stars and creation? He just spoke it. It was effortless. So he's telling you, look, not only does he tell you, you better fear him, but you better take heed. You better be careful what you're doing. And then he says, do it. In other words, yeah, fear him. Do it. And it ain't a uh, reverence, godly reverence. No, it's you better fear him because if you wanted to take you out, he'd take you out. Now, the, the blessing is, is that he's long suffering. He's patient. He's slow to anger. But it's said slow to anger. Eventually, he's going to get to that anger if you keep playing around. Verse 9 says, And he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do it. Do in. Right? So do. We're doing again. In the fear of the Lord. So whatever you're going to do, do it in the fear of the Lord. Faithfully and with a perfect heart. If you're not doing things for the Lord in the fear of the Lord, if you're not taking heed, if you're not working uh, carefully, If we're talking about things above, if you're doing things in the ministry, now you're playing around with God's people and with God's inheritance and with God's spiritual stuff. You're messing with people's souls. You're messing with people's uh, eternity. And so he tells you, look, you, you better be careful with how you're handling my people with doing my stuff. And do it in the fear of the Lord. Be faithful. And with a perfect heart. Because if you're not faithful and you're not doing it with a perfect heart, that's when you bring in the strange fire. And that's when you get wiped out. That's when you get, uh, was it Elijah's uh, kids? That they were messing around outside the temple? The only reason you, you can become that way is if you allow it to, uh, you get weak on your stand. If you, a little leaven, leaven if the whole lump. Uh, what was it? First Samuel tells you. First Samuel fifteen twenty two says it's a it's better uh, to obey than sacrifice. All right, you can sacrifice as much as you want to the Lord if your heart's twisted, it ain't doing you any benefit. But if you obey, that's where the power comes in. That's where everything comes from. Uh, you have a hymn that says "Trust and obey." There's no other way. To live godly in Christ Jesus. So you got warnings around here that says, look, do, uh, be careful with what you're doing. Walk in the fear of the Lord. And then you get the blessing. So you, you're supposed to, if you want to reign with him, you have to suffer with him. And nobody likes that beginning part where it says you have to suffer. So the world tells you you can reign down here. Be the God of your world down here. Be the king of your castle down here. And God says, it's not down here. It's constantly reminding you, it's not down here. It's up there. And so you have to ask yourself, if God says one thing and something is saying something else, well, the Bible is very clear, let God be true. And it says, every man a liar. So who's the opposite of God? Right? We talk about him on, on Wednesdays. Um, I'll stop it right there. Just remember that uh, it's a fight, but you and God are the majority. Strength comes from above. And take it one day at a time. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for uh, another day of life, being able to wake up and uh, make it a church. Thank you that we have the church to go to. You're with Pastor Ms. Jessica and uh,
teaching and preaching they got going on over there. We bring them back safe and sound. Be with the uh, AM and PM services, Lord. And we pray you come back soon. We ask all these things in your name, through your blood. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.